Even Muammar Gaddafi once argued that, that Shakespeare was an Arab sheikh from Libya, and his name was Sheikh Al Zubair. In 2003, at a Shakespeare and Islam symposium held at the Globe Theater, the well-known scholar of Islamic mysticism, Professor Martin Lings, claimed that Shakespeare was probably a Muslim Sufi leader. According to an Indian theory, his original name was Pierre Prickly Pear. The great film director, Peter Brook, heard from an Uzbek that the derivation of the name is from Shakespeare. There is also the claim that Shakespeare is simply the English translation of the Italian name Michelangelo Florio Crolanza. Some individuals spent or wasted a whole lifetime to prove that the bard was this or that person rather than a second-rate actor named William Shakespeare. There have been those who dug up the grave of some person or other. Speaking of grave digging, uh, one recalls a witty anecdote by W.S. Gilbert, a famous 19th century British actor. Gilbert always denigrated the renowned Shakespearean actor, Sir Herbert Beerbohm Tree, once he quipped, do you know how best to solve the Shakespeare-Bacon controversy? Open up their tombs and take the two coffins out, bring Sir Herbert Beerbohm Tree there to play Hamlet. Whichever dead man becomes enraged and keeps up a storm in his coffin, that is the real Shakespeare. I'm not sure if who Shakespeare was is a matter of uh, life and death. Does it matter who Homer was? Turkey's great mystic Yunus Emre, who composed magnificent humanistic and humanitarian poems in the late 13th and early 14th century, is unknown and, uh, and undocumented as to his life. So long as the plays and the poems exist and endure, what does it matter if it's Shakespeare or Bacon or Earl of Oxford. The tribute suffices, how wonderful is the call of admiration by Ben Jonson, soul of the age, the applause, delight, and wonder of our stage, rise my Shakespeare. Love is miraculous in Shakespeare's sonnets. Now, sonnet 18, which has become one of the most popular in Turkish translation as well. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling muds of bay, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dimmed, and every fair from fair sometime declines by chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair thou owest nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade, when in eternal lines to time thou growest. So long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. Seni bir yaz gününe benzetmek mi ne gezer? Çok daha güzelsin sen, çok daha cana yakın. Taze tomurcukları sert rüzgarlar örseler, Kısa çıktır süresi yeryüzünde bir yazın. Işıldar göğün gözü yakacak kadar sıcak ve sık sık kararır da yaldız düşer yüzünden. Her güzel güzellikten er geç yoksun kalacak kader ya da varlığın bozulması yüzünden. Ama hiç solmayacak sendeki ölümsüz yaz. Güzelliğin yitmez ki asla olmaz ki hurda gölgesindesin diye Ecel caka satamaz, sen çalları aşarken bu ölmez satırlarda. İnsanlar nefes alsın, gözler görsün el verir. Yaşadıkça şiirim sana da hayat verir. The sonnets are unforgettable. Forgetting reminds me of actors forgetting their lines. Being an actor, Shakespeare must have been aware of that problem. He occasionally mentions it. Like a dull actor now, I have forgot my part, and I am out even to a full disgrace. As you probably know, there have been innumerable instances of forgetting lines in Shakespeare performances. When John Barrymore was doing Richard III, the actor playing Ratcliffe was about to say, My lord, tis I, the early village cock hath twice done salutation to the morn. 
but got stuck after the early village cock. Started again, no use. Once more, couldn't get it. Again, Barrymore blurted out, why the hell don't you crow then? <laughs> A funny thing happened to Julia Marlowe when she was doing Olivia in Twelfth Night. She turned to the friar and delivered her first line perfectly. Then lead the way, good father, and heaven so shine. But Julia Marlowe drew a blank on the next line. Somehow, she came up with a rhyming line of her own in iambic pentameter. Then lead the way, good father, and heaven so shine. I cannot recall another blessed line. <laughs> Actors are an amazing bunch. Ed Edmund Cain, who dominated the London stage in the first three decades of the 19th century, was doing Othello. He roughed up Iago mercilessly. After the performance, a friend of his said to Cain, you nearly killed the chap. That is what I call enthusiastic acting. Cain looked at his friend in amazement and said, what are you talking about? I was really trying to kill the chap. He was upstaging me all the time. <laughs> Audiences, too, can be amazing. There was a charismatic Turkish actor, uh, uh, author, Javad Shakir, who used the pen name, as most of you know, the fisherman of Halicarnassus, Halicarnassus Balkchesi. He was an Oxonian, polyglot, irreverent, eccentric. He was also famous for his merhaba, hello. He even said, hello for goodbye. Once he went to see Macbeth, he was a little tipsy, more than a little. <laughs> They seated him in the front row. When he heard, hail Duncan, hail Macduff, hail Macbeth, that like Mar Marhaba Macbeth as they were uh, using it on the stage, he jumped to his feet and gave the cast a big Marhaba. <laughs> in the 19th century, there was a prominent Shakespearean actor director by the name of William Charles McCready. Once in his new Hamlet production, he had a King Claudius whom he found quite inferior. So he decided to keep the man in the rear of the stage, and he instructed Claudius to die at a spot way back on the stage. McCready himself was going to die all the way in front, as close to the audience as possible. Opening night, King Claudius, stabbed, came staggering and fell right into McCready's spot in front. McCready was taken aback and furious. He whispered, what are you doing here? Go back. Die in your own spot. Go on. <laughs> Claudius, almost dead, straightened up and said to McCready at the top of his voice, Look here, McCready. I did everything you asked me to do at the rehearsals. Now I am the king. I shall die wherever I please. <laughs> at another London performance at the end of Macbeth, something similar occurred. Macduff and Macbeth were at it brandishing their swords. Although he is supposed to die, Macbeth gave his all, refusing to be defeated to die. As Macbeth kept swinging his sword, poor Macduff nearly collapsed of exhaustion. He kept be begging, stop it, cut it short, please die, enough of this now. <laughs> no use, Macbeth almost managed to emerge victorious, to keep alive, to change the end. But a while later, he took pity on Macduff and Shakespeare and died. The audience loved all this. During the sword fight, they clapped rhythmically to encourage Macbeth, giving him a thunderous applause. They made dead Macbeth rise to his feet and gave him another wild round of applause. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm one Turk who believes in the natural superiority of women. And I feel that Shakespeare had been partial to his male characters. Now Lady Macbeth, Desdemona, Cleopatra, Portia, Gertrude, Ophelia, notwithstanding, his most memorable protagonists are men. Perhaps that is why Shakespeare has stolen the hearts of Turkish men. Well, for me, Katharina the Shrew is memorable. Taming her was a formidable task. In Turkey, taming of the Shrew was seldom successful probably because all Turkish girls are angelic. <laughs> there have never been a Turkish shrew. The only passage that all Turkish men agree with is, thy husband is thy lord, thy life, thy keeper, thy head, thy sovereign. 
one that cares for thee and for thy maintenance commits his body to painful labor both by sea and land to watch the night in storms, the day in cold, whilst thou liest warm at home, secure and safe, and craves no other tribute at thy hands but love, fair looks, and true obedience, too little payment for so great a debt. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Shakespeare scholars and enthusiasts, do you agree with me, for instance, that the bard gave Romeo much better lines than Juliet? At any rate, let me tell you an anecdote from, from Turkey. Uh, the, the, the, there's a venerable American school in Istanbul, as you know, Robert College, already 150 years old. Uh, that college produced many plays every year, amateur performances of, of almost professional caliber. In 1950, they did Romeo and Juliet in English, and uh, sophomore, who is now arguably Turkey's richest man, had a bit part, first watchman, with very few lines. He was going to enter, see Romeo and Juliet lying dead, and say, oh, what a pitiful sight. He swaggered in and said, oh, what a beautiful sight. <laughs> the audience roared with laughter. The entire cast was in guffaws, including the dead Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> Perhaps no one in the past four centuries has surpassed Shakespeare's sonnet sequence. The universal appeal of the sonnets has taken hold of Turkish poetry lovers as well. When I have seen by time's fell hand defaced the rich proud cost of outworn buried age, when sometime lofty towers I see down raised and brass eternal slave to mortal rage, when I have seen the hungry oceans gain advantage on the kingdom of the shore and the firm soil win of the watery main increasing store with loss and loss with store, when I have seen such interchange of state or state itself confounded to decay, ruin hath taught me thus to ruminate that time will come and take my love away. Gördüm anıtlarını nice görkemli çağın zamanın zalimeli yılıp etmiş yerli bir başları göğe delen kuleler darmadağın ve sonsuz tunç ölümün gazabına köledir. Gördüm o bur okyanus yenilgiye uğratmış, keyfince hüküm süren heybetli kıyıları ve sert toprak kendine koca ummanı katmış, zarar kârı arttırmış, kar büyütmüş zararı. Gördüm her şey bozulur, sonsuz sürüp gidemez, en sağlam devlet bile günün birinde çürür, er geç sevgilimi de zaman alıp götürür, bana ölüm gibidir, ölmesinden korkarak hiçbir şey yapamayıp, so, since the middle of the 19th century, Turkish literature and theater have been in feverish quest for innovation. The earlier part of this process was dominated by French culture, followed from the 1950s onwards by the increasing impact of Anglo-American literary and theatrical values uh, of all literary figures from abroad Shakespeare has been the most potent and enduring source of inspiration, certainly the most pervasive influence on modern Turkish theater. The Shakespearean art is vibrant in the Turkish heart. Our revels are now ended. These are actors, as I foretold you, who are all spirits and are melted into air, into thin air. And like the basest fabric of this vision, the cloud-capped towers, the gorgeous palaces, the solemn temples, the great globe itself, yea, all which it inherit shall dissolve, and like this insubstantial pageant faded, leave not a rack behind. We are such stuff as dreams are made on, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. Oh, wonder, how many goodly creatures are there here, how beauteous mankind is, Oh, brave new world that has such people in it.
Shakespeare, not only in Turkish hearts, mind, memory, in every part of Turkish people. He himself, I don't know what your impressions, he is more than Shakespeare, <laughs> I think. All right, I think we have some time, maybe for two or three comments, questions, or nothing at all. It's up to you. Any? Come on, don't be disheartened. Don't push your luck. <laughs> well, it seems that they are fully dazzled. They don't know what to say. They are full of absorbed all Shakespeare. Thank you very much, Talat Alman. You have been you are great.